Hello everyone and welcome to Solved, where we help you solve problems. In this video, we will be highlighting the steps necessary for us to determine the adiabatic flame temperature of a combustion process. The adiabatic flame temperature is simply the temperature of the flue gas if the reactor is adiabatic. That means that all of the energy released during combustion is transferred to the flue gas. The adiabatic flame temperature is also the maximum possible temperature that a flue gas can exit the burner. Let us illustrate how to solve for the adiabatic flame temperature by solving this problem. Consider 100 moles per second of propane, that's C3H8, at 25 degrees Celsius and 1 bar, being fed to a burner with 20% excess air. Determine the adiabatic flame temperature of the flue gas assuming complete combustion. Let's go ahead and solve this problem. Here we have represented our burner as accepting feed 100 moles per second of propane at 25 degrees Celsius and 1 bar as well as 20% excess air assumed to contain oxygen and nitrogen. The air is also at 25 degrees Celsius and 1 bar. Assuming complete combustion, our flue gas would only contain carbon dioxide, water, excess oxygen, and excess nitrogen. We are going to assume that our flue gas also exits at 1 bar. I have also written here our balanced combustion equation of propane, that is C3H8 plus 5O2 yields 3CO2 plus 4H2O. Now before we can solve for the adiabatic flame temperature, which falls under the energy balance part of the calculations, we first have to perform the material balance part. For that, we will be assuming our basis, which is one second of operation. Next, let us solve for NO2 theo, or the theoretical number of moles of oxygen needed to complete the combustion process. We have 100 moles of propane, C3H8, and using our balanced combustion equation, we are going to perform stoichiometry going to the moles of oxygen. One mole of propane is equivalent to five moles of oxygen. Our NO2 theo is 500 moles oxygen. This means that under complete combustion, we only need 500 moles of oxygen to complete the process. From this amount of the NO2 theo, we can use the definition of the percent excess in order to determine the amount of oxygen fed to the process. The percent excess is equal to NO2 fed minus NO2 theo all over NO2 theo. Since this is a value of 20% or 0.2, we can solve for the value of NO2 fed. That is 0.2 multiplied by 500, our NO2 theo, plus our NO2 theo again, 500. Our NO2 fed is 600 moles of oxygen. The number of moles of oxygen fed is also related to the number of moles of nitrogen fed. We simply multiply this by the ratio 79 over 21, indicating that our air is assumed to be 79% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. From that, we can solve for the number of moles of nitrogen fed. That is 600 multiplied by 79 divided by 21. That is 2,257.14 moles nitrogen. These two values are pertaining to the oxygen and nitrogen in our air being fed. So we now have those two values. For the next part, we have to solve for the amounts of the components in your flue gas. Let us represent CO2 as N1, water as N2, excess oxygen as N3, and excess nitrogen as N4. Let us perform atomic balances or elemental balances to determine the values of N1 to N4. Let's start with a carbon balance. Our carbon balance would give us 100 moles in the feed multiplied by 3 moles of carbon that's coming from C3H8 is equal to N1. Our N1 is equal to 300 moles of CO2. Next, let us have the hydrogen balance. From our feed, 100 moles of C3H8 multiplied by 8 moles of hydrogen is equal to 2 times N2. This is coming from the water in the flue gas. We have N2 is equal to 400 moles H2O. We have N2 is equal to 400 moles 
H2O. Next, let's have the oxygen balance. First, coming from air, that is 2 times the amount of oxygen fed, 600 moles, is equal to, on the flue gas side, that's 2N1 coming from CO2, plus N2 coming from water, plus 2N3 coming from the excess oxygen. Since we already have the values of N1 and N2, we can solve for N3. That is 2 times 600 minus 2 times N1, which is 300, minus N2, which is 400, divided by 2. Our N3 or our excess oxygen is 100 moles O2. This makes sense because our oxygen fed is 600 moles and the theoretical amount that will be consumed is only 500 moles. So that gives us a 100 mole oxygen excess. Next, we have the nitrogen balance. This is simply the amount of nitrogen fed coming from the air is equal to the amount of nitrogen in the flue gas since we are assuming that nitrogen is an inert in this process. That is a reasonable assumption because normally, even though nitrogen is oxidized in real-life combustion, the amounts of nitrogen oxides produced are very small compared to the other components. So we can neglect the combustion of nitrogen. Our nitrogen input is also equal to the nitrogen output. This gives us 2,257.14 moles of nitrogen. Now that we have completed the material balance part of the solution, we can now proceed to the energy balance part. From our energy balance equation, we can cancel the first term by assuming that our process is strictly steady state. That's why the derivative with respect to temperature will cancel. Also, we can assume that the contributions of the kinetic and potential energies are negligibly small. There is no shaft torque involved because we are only considering a burner. And we will also be cancelling our heat transfer term because we are solving for the adiabatic flame temperature. We are assuming that our burning process is adiabatic and that all of the energy released from the combustion is absorbed by the flue gas. So we are looking for the exit temperature of the flue gas. This simplifies our equation to the number of moles going in multiplied by the specific enthalpy of the inputs is equal to the number of moles going out multiplied by the specific enthalpy of the output. This equation is better represented as the total enthalpy of the reactants must be equal to the total enthalpy of the products. Let us break down this relationship. For the absolute enthalpy of the reactants, this is equal to the total number of moles of the reactants, which is 100 moles of propane, multiplied by the standard enthalpy of formation of propane plus delta H. The delta H accounts for enthalpy deviations if we are outside of the standard state. However, our reactants are already at the standard state of 25 degrees Celsius and 1 bar. That is why our delta H for the reactant side is equal to 0. This simplifies to the number of moles of the reactants multiplied by the standard enthalpy of formation of propane. We only need to consider the standard molar enthalpy of formation of propane and not of the air because air consists of oxygen and nitrogen in their standard state. So the standard enthalpy of formation for the air is zero. Next, let us have the enthalpy of the products. This is equal to the sum of the contributions of enthalpy of the components of the flue gas. So we have the number of moles of CO2 multiplied by the standard enthalpy of formation and the delta H for CO2. It is important that we account for the delta H of the flue gases because they are not at standard state. We expect the adiabatic flame temperature to be higher than that of the inlet temperature because there was a release of heat energy in the process of combustion. And since our reactor is adiabatic, that released heat energy has to be absorbed by the flue gas. We continue this by adding the number of moles of water vapor multiplied by the enthalpy of formation plus the delta H contribution of water vapor. Plus, that's the same for oxygen, enthalpy of formation plus delta H for excess oxygen plus for nitrogen. For both oxygen and nitrogen, their standard enthalpy of formation are both equal to zero since they are elements in their standard form. Simplifying this equation, we have the total enthalpy of the product is equal to 
the number of moles of CO2 times the enthalpy of formation of CO2 plus the number of moles of water plus the enthalpy of formation of water plus the summation of the number of moles and the delta H contributions of all of the species, that is CO2, water, oxygen, and nitrogen. The final term in our equation here is the most tedious one to assess because this involves a trial and error solution where we assume a value of the adiabatic flame temperature and then we check if it satisfies our relationship here. The enthalpy of the reactants must be equal to the enthalpy of the products. However, the enthalpy of the products is dependent on the final temperature or the adiabatic flame temperature. That's why we have to perform an iterative solution. Our overall solution can be written as the enthalpy of the reactants is equal to the enthalpy of the products. This is the number of moles of C3H8 multiplied by the standard enthalpy of formation of C3H8 minus the number of moles of carbon dioxide multiplied by the standard enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide minus the number of moles of water times the standard enthalpy of formation of water vapor. This is equal to our summation term of N sub I delta H sub I. I have written our equation in this form because all of the terms in the left-hand side of the equation can already be determined because we simply have to look for the standard enthalpy of formation values of the substances. The right-hand side of the equation is equal to the summation of the number of moles of the substances multiplied by the integral of the CP of the substances times dt. For this example, we have to consider the heat capacities of four different substances. Those are carbon dioxide, water, oxygen, and nitrogen gases. Let us first solve for the value of the left-hand side of the equation. From our material balance, we have a feed of 100 moles of propane. We multiply that with the enthalpy of formation of propane, which is negative 103.9 kilojoules per mole. And from this value, we subtract the amount of carbon dioxide in the flue gas, that is 300 moles of carbon dioxide, multiplied by the enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide, negative 393.522 kilojoules per mole, minus the amount of water in the flue gas, that is 400 moles, multiplied by the enthalpy of formation of water vapor. It's important that you select water vapor because water exits as a vapor in your burner. That's negative 241.826. The left-hand side of our equation has a value of 204,397 kilojoules. This value needs to be equal to the summation of all of the moles on the product side multiplied by the integral of their heat capacities times the I'm going to show you the backbone of this step-by-step -step procedure. However, the actual calculation will be performed in Microsoft Excel. Okay? So the first step is you assume an initial value of the adiabatic flame temperature. Let's say, for example, that our first assumption is it's 800 Kelvin. Remember that this is an assumption and we have to check if this is correct or not. So now that we have our first assumption of the adiabatic flame temperature, we can now carry out the integration of the CP functions. Remember that our delta HI in this case is equal to the integral of CPI times DT and the limit of integrations are from 25 degrees Celsius or 298.15 Kelvin up to the adiabatic flame temperature. Since we have assumed that our adiabatic flame temperature is 800 Kelvin, then we have limits of integration from 298 to 800 Kelvin. Now you have to consider this for four substances, for carbon dioxide, for water vapor, for nitrogen, and for oxygen. Each of these substances has their own CP functions. The CP is dictated as a function of A plus BT plus CT squared plus DT cubed. You simply have to read the values of the constants A, B, C, and D in your thermodynamics book. Okay? Once you integrate this expression and substitute the limits of integration, you will now be able to solve for the delta H of that substance. So we will have the delta H of CO2, the delta H of water, the delta H of nitrogen, and the delta H of oxygen. 
what we have to do next is we multiply this with the number of moles corresponding to those substances coming from the material balance we have performed earlier. Once we have multiplied those values, we simply take the summation of these products and the sum of this would be equal to the right-hand side of your equation. If the two sides of the equation are not equal, then you have to slash your initial assumption of the adiabatic flame temperature. You have to assume a new value, let's say for example 900 Kelvin, and then you have to perform again the integration of the heat capacity functions to determine the delta H, multiply them to their corresponding number of moles, take the summation, and then you have another value of the right-hand side of the equation. If that is still not equal, then you have to change your assumption again, and so on and so forth, until you make an assumption of the adiabatic flame temperature that gives you an equal amount of the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation. That is the backbone of the solution for determining the adiabatic flame temperature. Always remember that our goal is to have the left-hand side of the equation be equal to the right-hand side of the equation. The assumed temperature that leads to this condition will be your adiabatic flame temperature. Now that I have discussed the backbone of the solution, let me show you how it is done in Microsoft Excel. You can always perform these calculations by hand, but it becomes very tedious, especially you are integrating four expressions for four different compounds. Here we have our sample Excel spreadsheet to facilitate an easier determination of the adiabatic flame temperature. We have both the left-hand side of the equation as determined, that is 204,397. We also have our right-hand side of the equation. This is simply the summation of the products of the delta H and the moles coming from the material balance. The delta H are simply the integral of this expression of the heat capacity. Upon integration, this expression becomes A times T plus B times T squared over 2 plus C times T cubed over 3 plus D times T to the 4th over 4. It's just a simple integration of a polynomial expression. These are the constants A, B, C, and D for CO2, water vapor, oxygen, and nitrogen. This came from Fundamentals of Thermodynamics by Borgnake and Sontag. I have also listed the molecular weights of the substances here because our heat capacity when integrated would give us a unit of kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. So we need to convert that to kilojoules per mole per Kelvin in order for us to be dimensionally homogeneous. Okay, these are the obtained values of the delta H. And in here, we have the adiabatic flame temperature assumption box. If we assume that our adiabatic flame temperature is 800 Kelvin, the spreadsheet automatically calculates the right-hand side of the equation. So seeing that our right-hand side is not equal to the left-hand side of the equation, that means that we still have to increase our assumption for the adiabatic flame temperature. If we increase that to 1,000, still not equal. We make it 1,5, still not equal. We make it 2,000, still not equal. We make that 2,500. The right-hand side now exceeds the left-hand side of the equation. That means that our adiabatic flame temperature is between 2,000 and 2,500 Kelvin. Now you can manually adjust this field for the adiabatic flame temperature until you have an equal left-hand and right-hand side of the equation. But if you want to have a more exact value, we can use the goal seek function of Microsoft Excel. So when we go to goal seek, we simply set our right-hand side of the equation to be equal to the left-hand side, 204397 kilojoules. And that will be accomplished by changing the value of the adiabatic flame temperature assumption. So this is how we can perform an iterative solution in Microsoft Excel. So when we click OK, it simply performs all of the iterations and we are left with the value 2280 Kelvin. That means that this is already our final answer. We say that the adiabatic flame temperature of our system is 2280 Kelvin. This is the maximum possible exit temperature of your flue gases. And that is only possible if your reactor is perfectly adiabatic. With this example, I have demonstrated that it would be easier for us to use spreadsheet functionalities to perform an otherwise tedious iterative solution. That's the end of this video. Thank you for listening. And this has been another problem solved. Yeah.